During my journey through the subject of ENT as a student, the problems that I encountered during my term, during the exams, I've tried to solve over here. This cassette would include X-rays, instruments, and specimens. To begin with, the X-rays. Amongst the X-rays dealt with in ENT, the most commonly seen, or for the matter of fact, the most commonly advised X-ray is X-ray of the paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses, as you know, are having different anatomical locations, which means one single X-ray film cannot depict each of these sinuses clearly. To begin with, we would begin with the Calwell's view or the occipitofrontal view as you know it. The Calwell's view is taken in such a manner that the cassette is situated in front of the patient's face. The beam of light coming from behind the cassette in front of the patient's face so that maximum exposure is given to the frontal sinuses and the other paranasal sinuses. Now this is different from an x-ray skull as in an x-ray skull the rays come from front and the cassette is kept behind the skull. Therefore maximum exposure we get to the frontal sinuses in this occipital frontal view also known as Calville's view. Now we see few plates of the Calville's view. The first X-ray film of the occipital frontal or Calville's view shows the various structures, the frontal sinuses on either side, the nasal septum in the center, the ethmoid sinuses and the nasal turbinates. The maxillary sinus is not commented on the frontal view because the petrous apex of the temporal bone as you see on either side covers the maxillary sinus. Normally the frontal sinuses are paired sinuses, however the anatomical size has no relation to the pathology. The size of the sinuses may be different and they are never ever paired as the size is concerned. Normally as you see over here, the frontal sinuses show an intercellular septae. This gives it a clove-like appearance which is also known as a scalloping appearance. This means that the, each frontal sinus is composed of a number of air cells which constitutes one frontal sinus. The next plate of a Calville's view shows us the frontal sinuses which are much larger than the previous one which we had seen. These are known as a hyperneumatic or a very large frontal sinus. Hyperneumatic sinuses are commonly seen in patients of acromegaly. Here in the right frontal sinus we see a radio opaque shadow and this radio opaque shadow is an ivory osteoma because the density of the shadow is much more than the density of a bone so it's a bony tumor so this x-ray is labeled as a osteoma of the right frontal sinus what we should do in this case is remove a x-ray lateral skull because in a what Calville's view no idea is obtained on how big the osteoma is the intracranial extension or the external extension of an osteoma is only seen by a lateral skull which would determine what the treatment should be. If the osteoma is extending intracranially, it is removed by the neurosurgical approach and if it is ex extending externally by a plastic surgery approach for cosmetic reasons. As we have seen in the previous x-rays, the petrous apex of the temporal bone comes in the way of the maxillary sinuses and because of this reason, we cannot comment on the condition of the maxillary sinus in a uh, Calwell's view. So modification of this is known as Waters view, also known as occipital mental view. Here the patient's head is tilted in such a manner that the petrous apex now falls below the maxillary sinus, thus clearing all the obstacles in front of it. And in this view, we can clearly see the maxillary sinus and any disease is detected at its earliest. The view taken is similar to the Calville's view, but for the patient's head is given a tilt for 45 degrees so that the petrous apex 
comes below the maxillary sinus and the x-ray beam comes from behind to the x-ray plate which is facing the nose and chin in front. This is paranasal sinus waters view classically seen for the maxillary sinus. The various structures seen on a paranasal sinus waters view also known as an occipital mental view are the frontal sinuses which are projected obliquely, the maxillary sinus, the nasal septum, the odontoid process, the foramen magnum, the mentum and just above it through an open mouth the sphenoid sinus. Now the left maxillary sinus in this first plate shows a radiolucent shadow and this indicates that it is a normal maxillary sinus. To label a maxillary sinus pathological, the shadow has to be more dense as compared to that of the orbit. Now on the right side, here we see a radio opaque shadow which is having an air fluid level in the right sinus. This means that the patient has right maxillary sinusitis with an air fluid level. The method by which we confirm that this is an air fluid level is by repeating the x-ray in the lying down position. On the lying down position, the air fluid level disappears and it becomes a complete haziness or a complete radio opacity is seen in the maxillary sinus. However, the other second differential diagnosis that one would give with the opacity would be a polyp. But with a fluid level, as you see, the central point is at a lower level as compared to the peripheral point. This means that there is a concavity which points upwards which indicates that this is an air fluid level and indicates right maxillary sinusitis. Similarly, in the next x-ray plate, we see on the left side an air fluid level with concavity pointing upwards. So this indicates left maxillary sinusitis with a fluid level. The third plate, again a water's view, shows complete haziness of both the maxillary sinuses. Here the haziness is much more as compared to the orbit the orbit acts as a guideline or as a reference to the, path the pathology of the maxillary sinuses and here the walls of the maxillary sinus being intact indicate that this is chronic maxillary sinusitis. On the same x-ray lower down we see the odontoid process, the mentum. Now to note whether the extension given to the patient's head is adequate or not, this acts as a guideline that the odontoid process should lie below the mentum. If it does not lie below the mentum, the petrous apex of the temporal bone would obscure the view of the maxillary sinus and would give us a false clue that the patient suffers from maxillary sinusitis. Again over here, we see haziness of the maxillary sinus on the right side, but just note that the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus is destroyed. As compared to the left side, you can clearly see the lateral wall, while on the right side, the lateral wall has been eroded and this is suggestive of malignancy of the right maxillary sinus. The next plate shows the patient having an open mouth, a radiolucent shadow which is a sphenoid sinus and in the maxillary sinus we have a small opening which is marked by an arrow. I think you may be able to see it. It's the infraorbital foramen. On the right maxillary sinus we see two radio opaque shadows with convexity pointing upwards meaning the central point is highest as compared to the periphery exactly unlike a fluid level. So this is a right-sided bilateral or a multiple maxillary polyp. And in the last x-ray down over here we see a maxillary polyp classically showing a convexity pointing upwards in the right maxillary sinus. So this is a right maxillary polyp. The management of acute maxillary sinusitis is medical and chronic maxillary sinusitis surgical. A polyp is prolapsed edematous mucosa of the sinus. Therefore, treatment of the sinus is medical. We mean antibiotics, antihistaminics, nasal decongestants. And if the patient does not respond to this, a repeat x-ray still shows a fluid level. We go in for an antral puncture. An antral puncture can be performed at three consecutive sittings and even if then the patient does not respond to it, it indicates that there is an irreversible change in the maxillary sinus mucosa 
and this irreversible change has to be treated surgically. The treatment is then Calvin Luck, but Calvin Luck is only done for children above the age of 12 years because before that dentition is not complete, middle third of the face development is not complete and that becomes the only contraindication to this surgery. The next sinus that we see on the x-ray plates is the sphenoid sinus which is seen on a lateral skull view. In the lateral skull view, the sphenoid sinus is outlined with the cella tersica, anterior and posterior clenoid processes. The other classical feature seen on a lateral skull is the shadow of the nasopharynx. This shadow of the nasopharynx is quite of diagnostic value in cases of adenoids or malignancy of the nasopharynx where the air shadow is pushed anteriorly as the adenoids arise from behind or malignancy of the nasopharynx which occurs from the fossa of Rosenmuller which also occurs from behind. In cases of antroconal polyps which arise from the middle meatus opening, the air shadow is pushed behind and gives a small thin line and, and known as the crescentic sign quite diagnostic of an antroconal polyp. The next plate that we see just to complete the list shows the anterior, middle and posterior ethmoid sinuses. Here the view is known as base skull view. We see the anterior, middle and the posterior sinuses, the sphenoid sinuses, the foramen magnum with the odontoid process. However, just for your academic interest, this is the mastoid bone or the petrous part of the temporal bone and a small tube going into the nasopharynx is the eustachian tube on either side. If you could appreciate the opening of the foramen ovale, spinosum, rotundum is seen clearly on both the sides. In the next x-ray plate, we see a lateral view of the face showing a break in the architecture of the nasal bones and this indicates a fracture of the nasal bones which we clearly see in both the plates taken from the right as well as from the left side. In fracture nasal bones here the patient would present with history of trauma, there is swelling, deformity and tenderness on clinical examination. The patient requires a reduction of the nasal bones not for any purpose other than cosmetic reasons. The complications which would occur with fracture nasal bones are there could be CSF rhinorrhea, epistaxis, a septal hematoma and any orbital complications. So after ruling out any of these complications, reduction of fracture nasal bones is taken as an elective procedure for only cosmetic reasons. The next group of X-rays that would, which we would be seeing over here is X-ray mastoid. X-ray mastoid is taken as Schuller's view and it is different from lateral skull because the two temporal bones should not overlap each other. As we've seen in the X-ray lateral skull, as the two bones overlap, nothing can be made out in what the type of a mastoid is. So the Schuller's view is taken at an angle of 30 degrees in this manner. The X-ray beam is directed at an angle of 30 degrees to the ear which has to be radiographed close to the X-ray plate and this prevents an overlap of the other X mastoid or the other ear which is brought out of focus or out of field thus giving us only one mastoid without removing the other which makes the X-ray different from an X-ray lateral skull. As we've described in the position of the patient while an X-ray mastoid is taken, we require two plates for seeing both the mastoids. The X-ray mastoids are divided as pneumatic, sclerotic or a mastoid showing a radiolucent shadow. The, in the first X-ray we see a pneumatic X-ray mastoid where you see air cells all around crossing the confines of the dural plate and the sinus plate. So when the air cells can cross the confines of the dural and sinus plate, they are known as a pneumatic mastoid and this is seen in normal persons or in persons having healthy ears. 
The other structures that you see on an X-ray mastoid are the zygomatic process, the TM joint, the mandibular condyle, the external auditory canal, a small radiolucent shadow behind the external auditory canal is because of the lateral semicircular canal. This is the otic cap bone which is three times as dense as a normal bone and therefore it shows a radio opaque shadow seen in all cases or in all patients and it is physiological. The next x-ray again you see this is of the right side x-ray mastoid showing the air cells which are crossing the confines of the dural plate and sinus plate external auditory canal and TM joint in front. So both these x-rays are pneumatic x-ray mastoids seen in normal patients. The next x-ray you see shows the TM joint, the external auditory canal to line it the dural plate, the sinus plate behind, the dural and sinus plate meeting at a point which is known as a sinodural angle. This is a sclerotic mastoid or the absence of air cells is notable in this case. This is usually seen in patients with chronic otitis media but however can also be seen in normal patients. The next x-ray is showing a big radio lucent shadow in the mastoid cavity. This is arising from the external canal from the area of the attic. This radio lucent shadow can occur normally in a patient having a very large antral cell, a large periantral cell. But the commonest cause of this however being a cholestatoma eroding the mastoid bone and giving rise to a radiolucent shadow. The other causes rarely seen however are because of tuberculous mastoiditis, because of malignancy, metastasis from a distant part or a eosinophilic granuloma. The next x-ray is again similar showing the TM joint or the temporomandibular joint, the external canal and from the external canal you see a radiolucent shadow arising from the attic area quite indicative of a cholestatoma. However, these findings have to be collaborated with clinical findings to note the exact diagnosis of what the patient has. The next set of x-rays that we would be seeing is of a lateral neck depicting a retropharyngeal abscess. Normally the cervical spine has got a curvature. The prevertebral space is less than three-fifths of the body of the vertebra and this prevertebral space does not contain any air whatsoever. In the first x-ray we see straightening of the cervical spine, the curvature is lost and markedly increased prevertebral space which is much more than three-fourth of the body of the vertebra it's more than I think about three times the size of the body of the vertebra over here this is indicative of a retropharyngeal abscess in a child the next x-ray again shows loss of cervical spine curvature increase of the prevertebral space depicting a retropharyngeal abscess in a child, a retropharyngeal abscess occurs secondary to either dental infection or tonsillar infections. So after a retropharyngeal abscess has been diagnosed on an x-ray, it needs to be drained immediately like any other abscess in the body. However, the only point to remember over here is that a retropharyngeal abscess is to be drained under local anesthesia, whatever the age of the patient may be a neonate, infant or in of any age. Because while introducing an endotracheal tube, one is sure to damage or to burst this abscess. The patient will aspirate the abscess and will, it will be fatal condition on table. So the drainage is done under local anesthesia. After the abscess has settled down, the dental infection or the tonsillar infection is tackled as the patient may be prone to recurrent attacks of a retropharyngeal abscess. Similarly, a retropharyngeal abscess can also occur in an adult. We see it in the next x-ray. Here the cervical spine is straightened. It has lost its normal curvature. There is radio opacity in front of the vertebra, which is the prevertebral space. Now the straightening of the spine occurs that whenever there is a collection of fluid, it causes 
reflex spasm of the prevertebral muscles, paravertebral muscles and straightens the cervical spine. The retropharyngeal abscess we can see over here has to be always seen very clearly if there is any foreign body lying inside. The commonest cause of a retropharyngeal abscess in adults is secondary to a foreign body which may be either a chicken bone, mutton bone or because of cock spine or tuberculosis of the spine resulting in destruction of the normal anatomical architecture of the vertebra. So after drainage of a retropharyngeal abscess in an adult, a foreign body is searched for or if the patient has cock spine, scraping and fixation of the cervical spine has to be done at a later date followed by anti-tuberculous treatment. Over here again the drainage of the abscess is done under local anesthesia. The next set of x-rays that we would be seeing are dealing with foreign bodies in the aerodigestive tract. Now foreign bodies have commonly which we find over here are coins and coins take up to a certain plane or a certain position in the esophagus or trachea because of its anatomical contour. The reason is that the esophagus has got a transverse diameter which is much greater than the anteroposterior diameter while the trachea is a C-shaped cartilage joined by trachealis muscle behind having a greater AP diameter and a smaller transverse diameter. So coins when which get lodged in the aerodigestive tract if found in the trachea they get lodged in the anteroposterior diameter while in the esophagus in the transverse diameter. So when we take an anteroposterior view on an x-ray in the trachea it is seen as a slit like structure while in the esophagus the whole coin is seen and the reverse is seen on an x-ray lateral neck or chest. This is the distinguishing feature on an x-ray whether the coin is in the trachea or in the esophagus. The first x-ray that we see over here shows a slit like shadow seen in the upper third of the esophagus on a lateral neck view. This means that the patient has a foreign body in the upper third of the esophagus. The next x-ray again shows a foreign body, probably a coin in the upper third of the esophagus on the lateral neck view. Now this is the commonest site where foreign bodies get stuck in the esophagus and this occurs secondary to spasm of the cricopharynx muscle. A repeat x-ray is taken after 6 hours. The patient, if we, we see the x-ray at the same position, we do esophagoscopy and we remove the foreign body. The next x-ray shows an AP view or an anteroposterior view showing the full coin or the whole coin is seen over here. This is because as I told you that in the esophagus, the coin always lies in the transverse plane as it is the greatest diameter. However, a similar AP view if taken would show only a slit of the coin. A vertical slit is seen because the larynx and the trachea have a very large AP plane and a small transverse diameter. So here the foreign body is situated in the larynx as well as partly in the trachea, showing foreign body larynx and foreign body esophagus, the same coin but different anatomical positions which the coin takes up due to the different configurature of the two structures. The next set of x-rays is again depicting foreign body in the esophagus but different types of foreign bodies that we will encounter over here. The first x-ray shows a radiopaque shadow which is not as dense as the coin which we saw in the previous one. A circular foreign body which shows air trapping below and above the foreign body. This occurs due to reflex spasm of the cricopharynx and other pharyngeal muscles. This foreign body was a marble. So any smooth foreign bodies which are found in the tracheobronchial trees or in the esophagus require a different maneuver or a mechanism for the removal because holding these foreign bodies with forceps 
would lead to only pushing the foreign body more distally. So what is done is a Foley's catheter is introduced into the pharynx, pushed distally and the bulb is inflated. After the bulb is inflated, the catheter is gradually pulled out, taking support of the foreign body, it is removed. A similar thing is done for foreign bodies in the bronchus, which may be either beads, circular ball bearings, which are difficult to hold with the forceps, are removed with the help of dormia basket, which is used in urology for stone removal. The next foreign body that we see is a pin at the laryngeal inlet. It's a traumatic foreign body, so while removing such foreign bodies, we have to take care that the traumatic end does not damage the mucosa. So for this, what we do is we take the scope within the foreign body and the foreign body is removed. However, this is not possible always. For example, if the patient has swallowed a safety pin which lies open in the esophagus, it has to be removed with certain precautions. The pin is either broken into two and removed in pieces or the pin can be pushed down into the stomach, rotated such that the pointed end points downwards and then can be removed safely or the pointed end is taken within the scope and the scope and the pin are removed simultaneously. However, nowadays we also have safety pin closing forceps where you introduce the forcep, close the pin and then remove it. The other foreign body that we see in the next x-ray shows a screw with the pointed end pointing downwards. So this will not cause any damage while removing it. The next foreign body over here that you see is a chicken bone or a mutton bone seen at the upper third of the esophagus. This is again removed with an esophagoscopy taking care that the pointed part of the bone does not damage the esophagus and does not cause a vertical tear of the mucosa. Foreign body bronchus. Now depending on the type of foreign body, the patient gives a different type of a reaction symptoms. The x-rays also give a different picture. The foreign body can be either a bead, a button or a ring. Example, a foreign body having an opening in the center. So these foreign bodies allow to and fro passage of air on either side of the foreign body. So this is the first type of foreign body that we deal with where this being the bronchus, the foreign body and air can pass on either side. So with to and fro passage of air, the patient is never breathless, only gives a history of foreign body ingestion. The x-ray also does not show any change other than the foreign body. The second type of foreign bodies that we encounter are such metallic foreign bodies which do not have openings in the center, which do not allow air to pass within it and therefore no ingress or egress of air and the patient is breathless over here and we see certain lung changes which are explained by the following figure. The foreign body which is lodged inside allows ingress of air because as you know on inspiration the tracheal and bronchial diameter increases in size it allows air to enter but on expiration there is a collapse of the trachea and the bronchus to push out the air and this leads to closure of the space between the foreign body and the trachea and bronchus allowing no egress of air and this causes obstructive emphysema distal to the foreign body. So the x-ray change which we would see over here would be an obstructive emphysema, the patient is breathless. However, the third type of foreign body that we see are P, B, P ground nuts which swell because of their hygroscopic nature. They increase in size while in the bronchus itself and therefore totally obstruct the bronchus not allowing air to enter even on inspiration and obviously air does not go out on expiration. Therefore this leads to collapse of the lung distal to the foreign body 
and no entry or exit of air is possible in this case. So here we see changes of collapse, compensatory emphysema of the rest of the lung which is normal and the patient here is very breathless necessitating an emergency bronchoscopy and a tracheostomy. So these are the three types of foreign bodies that a patient can present with and we now go on to the x-ray findings. The first x-ray which we see shows a foreign body which is a screw in the right bronchus. Now foreign bodies are commoner in the right as compared to the left because the right bronchus is a direct continuation of the trachea. It is shorter in length, it is, has a wider diameter. The right lung has got three lobes as compared to the left so the inspiratory suction force is greater on the right side causing the right foreign bodies to be more commoner than the left ones. This foreign body being a screw, a metallic one, does not increase in size, allows passage of air on either side of the foreign body and therefore there are no lung changes seen with this foreign body. The next type of foreign body that we go to, the patient had a P in the right bronchus but this is not seen on the x-ray. As you know all foreign bodies are not radio opaque. So we go on to the corroborative evidence from the x-ray findings which make us suspicious that the patient has a foreign body in the bronchus. On the right lower lobe is an area of collapse. So the foreign body was probably obstructing the right lower lobe causing collapse and similarly the rest of the lung is normal and not only normal shows changes of compensatory emphysema. There is greater radiolucency on the right side as compared to the left. There is greater intercostal spaces but on the right as compared to the left and it also shows flattening of the dome of the diaphragm. So these findings of a collapse and compensatory emphysema indicate that the patient will have a foreign body on the right bronchus. A classical feature seen in foreign bodies which swell up or which are hygroscopic in nature causing complete obstruction of the lumen of the bronchus leading to a collapse of the lung on one side show a feature which is known as mediastinal shift. Mediastinal shift is change of the position of the mediastinum with each phase of respiration and this occurs because If a foreign body is lodged into the right main bronchus causing a complete collapse of the right side it leads to compensatory emphysema of the left, collapse of the right, the whole mediastinum shifts to the right. On inspiration air only enters the right lung and this causes a shift of the mediastinum further to the right. On expiration the air on the left side is given out and now the mediastinum comes back to its previous position. So this alternation or shift of the position of mediastinum with each phase of respiration that occurs because of a collapse of the lung and on the other side a compensatory hypertrophy of the lung which is again secondary to a foreign body is quite significant when a foreign body is not seen. We will see an x-ray now where you will see a feature of mediastinal shift where x-ray plates have been taken in the, both the phases of inspiration as well as expiration. Uh, mediastinal shift is classically seen in this x-ray plate where the foreign body was not seen. This is a film taken on inspiration. The mediastinum is quite in position a little to the left however and the same plate on expiration shows the mediastinum shifted to the left. So this change or shift of mediastinum with each phase of respiration is indicative of a foreign body of the bronchus. On a barium swallow of the esophagus, the strictures seen on the esophagus are classically divided as the benign type and the malignant type. The malignant type shows certain classical features which make them different from the first one. The first feature that we classically see 
is there is an abrupt narrowing in the area of the barium passing into the esophagus. This abrupt change occurs because of eversion of fungating edges of a malignant ulcer in the esophagus and this gives rise to a shouldering effect or an acute angled effect which is classically known as a shouldering sign for CA esophagus. This is absent in a benign structure where the narrowing occurs quite gradually. The, the acute angle that you see over here is not seen and what we see is a gradual narrowing that you see on the next plane in achalasia cardia. The other features of CA esophagus are an apple core appearance. The apple core appearance is like after eating an apple the upper and the lower end is left behind with the small central core and this is also classical of a malignant stricture of the esophagus. The other features in malignancy are there is irregularity of the esophageal mucosa, there is no proximal dilatation. Now proximal dilatation does not occur because malignancy of the esophagus spreads very fast and secondly the vertical lymphatics in the esophagus prevent the dilatation of the esophagus. Now again lower down over here we see irregularity of the mucosa, a long stricture with a thin barium outline and this is known as a rat tail appearance in CA esophagus. So a rat tail appearance, shouldering, irregularity of the mucosa, absence of proximal dilatation would all classically feature it as a malignant stricture of the esophagus. Now we see a benign structure of the esophagus where a gradual narrowing is seen unlike the shouldering effect or an abrupt narrowing as in the previous x-ray. We see dilatation of the proximal part of the esophagus. We see an air fluid level. So this is an x-ray of achalasia cardia where you see an air fluid level, absence of fundic gas bubble, widening of the whole mediastinum as well as you can see signs of pneumonia or lung abscess and this occurs as there is stasis of food and secretions there is an aspiration and the patient usually has a very bad chest in the form of a pneumonia or a lung abscess. So this is a chalasia cardia. Tumors of the larynx are classified as tumors anywhere else in the body as malignant and benign ones. However, malignant tumors form 95% that is bulk of the malignant of the tumors of the larynx and amongst these 95% malignant tumors, 85% of them are squamous cell carcinomas. So malignancy of the larynx is generally synonymous with a squamous cell carcinoma. Amongst the benign tumors, 85% of them happen to be juvenile laryngeal papillomas. So today we would be dealing with basically squamous cell carcinomas and pa laryngeal papillomas. The larynx is anatomically divided into three main parts. Which is the supraglottis, the glottis which you see is marked by an arrow over here and below it is the subglottis. Now these three regions of the larynx are anatomically, embryologically different. The blood supply, nerve supply is different, the lymphatic drainage is different, the way a tumor metastasizes from that part, presents from the part is different and therefore we deal with each of the parts separately. Now let's go on to the specimen of malignancy of larynx. This is a surgical specimen of the larynx with the tongue you can see on the top and below it is a part of the trachea. The trachea is showing an opening that is an opening of a tracheostomy. On the right side there is a growth 
which is involving the subglottis, glottis and the supraglottic structures. So the, there is a laryngeal growth which involves the, all the three areas or the anatomical landmarks of the larynx. It spreads laterally to the pyriform fossa which means that this is a growth of the laryngopharynx. A patient with such a growth usually presents with hoarseness of voice, pain in the ear because of a referred pain, dysphagia, hemoptysis and if the laryngeal inlet is blocked causing strider. These growths are seen commonly in men as compared to women, the ratio being 8 is to 1, the predisposing factors, smoking, tuberculosis, chronic vocal strain, laryngeal papillomas or a leukoplakic patch on the larynx. The incidence of the laryngeal tumors according to the various areas is supraglottis 35%, glottic tumors 60% and subglottis 5%. The spread of the tumor may be either a local spread, a lymphatic spread or a blood-borne spread. The lymphatic spread is to either from the supraglottis to the upper and mid deep cervical nodes. From the glottis, the lymphatic spread is very rare because the glottis hardly has any lymphatics. From the subglottis, the spread is to the upper mediastinal lymph nodes. The blood borne spread is either to bone or to the liver. The classification of CA larynx or malignancy of the larynx is according to the standard TNM classification however with a little modification. The supraglottis, glottis or subglottis may be involved and these anatomical areas are kept as the indicators for spread. T1 growth means that the laryngeal tumor is involving one anatomical region. This region may be either the supraglottis, glottis or the subglottis. T2 when the tumor spreads to another adjacent anatomical area which means a glottic tumor becomes supraglottis or a subglottic tumor becomes glottic. T3 if the tumor involves whole of the larynx which we also label as a transglottic tumor and a T4 tumor is a one which spreads beyond the confines of the larynx which is also known as an extra laryngeal growth or spread of the malignancy. The nodal classification is labeled into N1, N2 and N3. N1 meaning the size of the lymph node metastasis is less than 3 centimeters, N2 where it is more than 3 but less than 6 centimeters in size and N3 more than 6 centimeters. This is a newer form of classification for the lymph nodes and it does away with the old term of fixity and mobi mobility. Because fixity of a lymph node is quite a subjective element and measurement of the node classifying it into either stage 1, 2 and 3 brings a more objective form of diagnosis. Here this is important because a single change of stage in the diagnosis of a malignancy of larynx could mean a drastic change in the treatment. However, this does is on the same basis as the older classification of fixity because it has been seen that for any lymph node to become fixed the size has to be at least 6 centimeters in size. So this being a more objective classification is taken into use or in practice now. The metastasis is M0 where there is no metastasis and M1 presence of metastasis. The treatment for malignancy of the larynx is different according to the involvement or according to the stage of the tumor. However, whenever any surgical specimen is shown, we cannot stage the tumor because we do not have the lymph nodes over here, we do not have the liver or the spleen and therefore no surgical specimen should ever be staged in the examination. The treatment for stage 1 tumors is radiotherapy. Now radiotherapy is preferred because it saves the laryngeal functions, functions of protection, functions of phonation. It, the patient does not have to undergo surgery, does not have a tracheostome throughout life. Therefore, radiotherapy is preferred for smaller tumors or stage 1 tumors. For stage 2 tumors, the treatment of choice is either radiotherapy or surgery 
as both give equal results. However, the choice depends on whether the patient is fit or willing for surgery and the facilities available in the hospital. Stage 3 tumors, the treatment of choice is surgery and stage 4 tumors, we give a combined modality of treatment for the patient which means radiotherapy, surgery followed by radiotherapy or chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy. So it's a combined modality where all three also can be used to combat the extension of this laryngeal tumors. Surgery has certain drawbacks like removal of a surgical specimen would lead to loss of speech. Secondly, the protective mechanism of the larynx, which is a three-tiered mechanism, the supraglottis where the epiglottis falls back at the fall level of the false cords which close on deglutition and the true cords, the three-tier mechanism which protects the laryngeal inlet, the lower respiratory passages from aspiration, they are lost. Secondly, we do not breathe through the nose. There is a tracheostomy opening as you see in the specimen of this larynx and therefore the bypass of air from the nose leads to anosmia. During straining, for example lifting up heavy weights, during defecation, micturation, there is an increase of intra-abdominal pressure, the chest gets fixed and the laryngeal inlet, the, supra, uh, the false cords and true cords approximate. This is not possible after a laryngectomy, so the patient has a very restricted life, meaning he cannot strain, he cannot carry heavy weights, he cannot climb a mountain and so on so forth. And however, one another drawback which a patient may face will be that he cannot go for swimming. So these are the handicaps a patient faces with a laryngectomy. Now this specimen which we see over here is not an antimortem specimen because as you see along with the specimen of the larynx, we have a, the tongue which has been removed as well as the trachea while this is not necessary for a laryngectomy. So this is a postmortem specimen of the larynx, a growth of the larynx as well as the pharynx. So we call it a postmortem specimen. This is a specimen again of the larynx with a part of the trachea. The trachea is showing an opening which is the tracheostomy. On the outer surface we can see the trachea with some amount of skin around it and the opening which is the tracheostomy. The larynx shows a growth on the right side of the supraglottic area involving the glottis and the subglottis. The horizontal slit that we see over here is the ventricle of the larynx. The upper fold of the horizontal slit is formed by the false cords while the lower one by the true cords. Which means this is a transglottic growth of the larynx. As far as the tumor classification goes, it's a T3 growth and nodal classification and metastasis cannot be found out so we do not stage this specimen. As it's a growth primarily of the larynx, this patient would present with change of voice, hemoptysis and later on respiratory distress or strider which means noisy breathing for which a uh, tracheostomy must have been done. Now this is a post-mortem specimen of the larynx because if you see on the outer side, lobes of the thyroid gland are seen on the outer side and during a laryngectomy there is no need to do a total thyroidectomy or else the patient will have to be on thyroid agents throughout life as well as calcium agents. So this is a post-mortem specimen of the larynx as well as the thyroid gland and what you see below is the tracheostomy opening which has been excised during surgery to prevent any spread from the metas or metastasis from the site of the opening into the larynx. This is a specimen of the larynx with the tongue and a part of the trachea. The trachea is showing an opening which is the tracheostomy opening. At the inlet of the larynx 
we see multiple finger like processes whitish in color involving the whole inlet of the larynx so this is a specimen of a multiple juvenile laryngeal papilloma a laryngeal papilloma in an adult is much different from that in a child because in a child they are multiple in number in an adult single in a child they regress by puberty in an adult they never ever regress at all in a child they never ever turn malignant unless they are irradiated while in a adult they may turn malignant a laryngeal papilloma in a child is compared to that like a virus formed wart and because the wart is formed because of a virus the laryngeal papilloma is also said to be infective in origin but the other various reasons why a papilloma may form is because of any you know, genetic reasons because of endocrinal or hormonal pathologies because the, you find there are number of reasons why a path laryngeal papilloma may form it indicates that the exact cause is not known a child usually presents with respiratory distress especially during night because during sleep these papillomas fall on themselves and close the laryngeal inlet causing strider the papillomas are seen equally in boys as well as girls there is no predilection to any sex in this but however a genetic predisposition is always seen the treatment for a papilloma is previously we used to give tetracyclines bovine wart vaccines and surgical degloving of the tumor was done but however now it has been seen that tu these tumors in children are known for their high recurrence rates they are left as it is however the inlet of the larynx may be cleared with laser laser light amplification stimulated by emission of radiation is the treatment of choice because it not only burns the tumor but it prevents any damage to the neighboring structures of the larynx a tracheostomy is done as an elective procedure because unfortunately these tumors are known for their regression and therefore a child may get re into respiratory distress at night may not re be able to reach the hospital and therefore a tracheostomy so this is a laryngeal papilloma in a child it is a post mortem specimen because there is no role of surgery no role of excision in such a case so post mortem specimen of a multiple juvenile laryngeal papilloma this is a specimen of the esophagus it is the esophagus because it's a hollow tubular organ there is absence of serosa on the external surface on the cut surface on the inner side longitudinal folds are seen and on the lower end a cardia or the dilated portion of the stomach is seen so this being the specimen of the lower third of the esophagus shows an ulceration in the inner surface between the longitudinal folds shaggy necrotic margins are seen and on the external surface there is a swelling which either may be a lymph node metastasis or the base of the ulcer so this is a malignant ulcer what you see of the lower third of the esophagus esophageal malignancies are not very common over here but still they are not uncommon the predisposing factors to ca esophagus are achalasia cardia as a result of stasis of food in the esophagus it predisposes to a malignant lesion barrett's esophagus corrosive strictures of the esophagus diverticulosis and plummer vincens syndrome the symptoms are patient comes with dysphagia hemop hematemesis or there may be signs of metastasis giving rise to other lesions unfortunately esophageal malignancies present very late and the treatment is also difficult this renders the prognosis very poor 
CA esophagus again has different routes of spread depending on the area of involvement. Like the larynx, the esophagus is divided into three parts, upper, mid and lower. They have different anatomical variations like the blood supply, the nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage. All three are different. And the type of tumor which one gets at each of these regions is also different. The upper third of the esophagus usually we see squamous cell carcinomas while in the lower third adenocarcinomas are seen. The treatment for upper third is mainly radiotherapy because squamous cell carcinomas respond to radiotherapy and it is very difficult to approach the mediastinum and if there is an infection mediastinitis could prove a very fatal condition. However, lower third of the esophagus is always treated surgically. The reason being that these tumors are adenocarcinomas because they arise from the gastric mucosa. The treatment is surgery also because after excising the part of the esophagus, the stomach contents are pulled up into the chest and the replaced, they are replaced. So loss of esophageal tissue can be easily done by the esophagus. And the lastly, that adenocarcinomas are radio resistant. So the only form of treatment available is surgery. This is a post-mortem specimen of C. A. esophagus. Previously, all the specimens which we saw were post-mortem because structures which were removed were in excess. However, over here, this is post-mortem because it does not confer to the principles of cancer surgery. The structures that have been removed is much less than what ought to be. In the esophagus, one finds satellite lesions 10 centimeters above and 10 centimeters below. This is because of the vertical spread of lymphatics. We call it the submucosal lymphatics. These submucosal lymphatics find satellite lesions 10 centimeters away even when the intervening mucosa is normal. So for any surgery for malignancy of the esophagus, 10 centimeters margin has to be kept and therefore this becomes a postmodern specimen because the amount of tissue excised is less than what is required. Now esophageal malignancies have poor prognosis because of the absence of cirrhosis, delayed manifestations of the symptoms, easily spreading because of the submucosal lymphatics and the mediastinum itself acting as a hindrance to the surgical approaches to the esophagus.